welcome back guys now in this video let's discuss about the topic of intersex guys this is a very interesting topic rather i should say this is my favorite topic guys before understanding intersex one should know the basics about how normal reproductive organs develop in a male and female embryos guys i have completely discussed that topic in a different video okay that is development of male and female reproductive organs and congenital anomalies that's a totally different video but in this video to make the concept more clear i'm going to touch upon that area briefly without any further ado let's start with the development of male genitalia guys in a male embryo we all know that there is presence of this y chromosome why because males are xy because of the presence of this y chromosome there is this srvi gene and we all know that srvi gene which is also known as a testis determining factor see this srvi gene is going to code for the development of testis and we know that in this testicular tissue there are these serotonin cells and these serotonin cells are making mullerian inhibiting factor in the name itself it's very clear mullerian inhibiting factor so this factor is going to inhibit the mullerian ducts once the mullerian ducts are inhibited are regressed in a male fetus there is no mullerian duct derivatives what does i mean by so a male fetus is going to make the mullerian inhibiting factor and that mullerian inhibiting factor will cause the regression of the mullerian ducts in a male fetus so mullerian duct derivatives like uterus fallopian tubes cervix and upper two third of vagina they are not going to develop in a male fetus why do male require uterus fallopian tube cervix and upper two third of vagina male does not require all these structures so these structures are not formed in a male fetus because the mullerian ducts are regressed okay now after that please concentrate on the next half of the slide see these leading cells are going to make a testosterone now this testosterone is going to act on the wolfian duct the male duct now important point is that for the expression or for the development of this wolfian duct it is very much important to have this functional testosterone only if there is testosterone wolfian duct will be expressed if there is no testosterone wolfian duct will also undergo regression so in this condition this is a male fetus it's making the testosterone so wolfian ducts are going to express and the expression or the development of this wolfian duct is going to produce male internal reproductive organs like epididymis seminiferous tubules prostatic urethra vas deferens so all this male internal reproductive organs are developed because of the expression of wolfian duct okay internal reproductive organs okay what about the external reproductive organs see some amount of this testosterone is going to convert into a more potent form of androgen that is a dihydrotestosterone so dihydrotestosterone is being formed in a male fetus with the help of enzyme 5 alpha reductase so testosterone getting converted into dihydrotestosterone see what is this dihydrotestosterone is doing see this dihydrotestosterone plays a very very important role in the formation of male external genitalia what it is doing this dihydrotestosterone is going to act on certain embryological regions like genital a tubercle genital swellings and genital folds so whenever these embryological regions whenever they are act acted upon by this dihydrotestosterone these regions will convert into male external genitalia so please concentrate there is development of glans penis scrotum and penile urethra all these are male external genitalia okay so this is how a male internal reproductive organs are formed and male external reproductive organs are formed and also very clear why a male does not have uterus fallopian tube cervix and vagina why because the mullerian duct in a male is inhibited by mullerian inhibiting factor from serotonin cells the concept is that for example a male is not producing mullerian inhibiting factor okay let's take a hypothetical scenario for example now 
a male is not producing mullerian inhibiting factor what happens now in this male fetus there is no mullerian inhibiting factor so the mullerian ducts are not going to undergo regression so they will undergo expression they will develop so that a male fetus can have uterus fallopian tubes upper to upper to third of vagina and cervix yes it is possible if a male is not making mullerian inhibiting factor then this male can develop all these structures true now one more concept is that dihydrotestosterone is converting these embryological regions into male external genitalia for example for some time let's think like this there is no dihydrotestosterone whenever there is no dihydrotestosterone what happens what happened to these embryological regions whenever there is no dihydrotestosterone these embryological regions are going to convert into female external genitalia so there is this male fetus and this male fetus is failed in producing the dihydrotestosterone so this male will develop female external genitalia that is vulva so a male can have vulva possible a male can have uterus possible okay so all these are the concepts now let's talk about development of a female genitalia now there is this female embryo and female embryo doesn't have this y chromosome yes and there is absent of this sry gene now whenever the sry gene is absent or testis determining factor is absent automatically the gonads will become ovaries now we all know that in ovaries sertoli cells are not there leydig cells are not there see sertoli and leydig cells they are present in the testis so whenever there are no sertoli cells there is no mullerian inhibiting factor now whenever there is no mullerian inhibiting factor the mullerian ducts in a female they are expressed so a female will have uterus fallopian tubes cervix and upper two third of vagina so the mullerian duct is getting developed in a female fetus now please concentrate on the next half of the flow chart now just like the sertoli cells leydig cells are also not there whenever there are no leydig cells there is no testosterone whenever there is no testosterone guys this is very very important i have already said that for the development of wolfian duct you need to have a functional testosterone whenever there is no testosterone what happens to the wolfian duct in the female females also have this wolfian duct so the wolfian duct in a female fetus will undergo regression so as the there is absence of this testosterone wolfian duct is undergoing regression in a female okay well and good what about the external genitalia development okay what about the external genitalia development in a female guys as there is no testosterone do you think there will be dihydrotestosterone in a female no first of all there are no leydig cells no testosterone so how can there be dihydrotestosterone there is no dihydrotestosterone whenever there is no dihydrotestosterone what happens what i have said you whenever there is no dihydrotestosterone automatically by default the external genitalia will become a female the basic default human genitalia is female okay so it is testosterone or i should say dihydrotestosterone who decides the fate of genitalia if there is dihydrotestosterone there will be development of male genitalia if there is no dihydrotestosterone by default the genitalia will become the external genitalia will become female or vulva okay now see there is no dihydrotestosterone what's happening to the external genitalia external genitalia of a female are formed this genital tubercle it's now forming the clitoris now genital swellings are going to form the labia majora and genital folds they are making the labia minora okay now let me explain this concept in a bit more detail okay now please concentrate on this slide guys see this is a undifferentiated stage okay now i am taking an undifferentiated stage and the structure which i am showing you here this yellow color structure is a genital 
tubercle and these a uh, midline folds okay are these medial folds which i am highlighting right now these are genital folds and these swellings which are present more laterally okay these swellings they are known as genital swellings so this is an undifferentiated stage which is the common for both male and female fetuses this is a undifferentiated stage which is present in both the sexes now if it is a male male is going to have testis and testis have these cells which are known as the leading cells they are going to make testosterone and testosterone is getting converted into dihydrotestosterone and this dihydrotestosterone is going to act on this embryological structures so what happen guys see this genital tubercle this yellow structure is going to form the glans penis now this a midline fold genital folds they are forming the penile urethra and these swellings okay these lateral swellings they will fuse okay they will fuse and they will form this scrotum okay now please concentrate on the female side females do not have the testis there is no testosterone and there is no dihydrotestosterone so the same structure is going to form the vulva in the female so this genital tubercle this genital tubercle is going to form the clitoris now these medial swellings genital folds these genital folds they are going to form the labia minora and the lateral folds these lateral folds these genital swellings okay they are going to form the labia majora okay so it's the mere presence of dihydrotestosterone determines the fate of external genitalia dihydrotestosterone present male genitalia simple absence female genitalia now if someone ask you that for the formation of a female external genitalia do you need estrogens no estrogens are not required for the formation of a female external genitalia estrogens are very much important for the formation of a breast but for the formation of vulva estrogens are not required simple absence of dihydrotestosterone female reproductive organs okay so this is the basics now let's discuss about mullerian agenesis what exactly happening in the mullerian agenesis guys in the name itself very clear mullerian agenesis so mullerian ducts they are not getting developed where do we need development of mullerian ducts guys in a female in a female if mullerian ducts are not developing means what happens the derivatives of mullerian ducts are not going to be formed what are the derivatives of mullerian ducts guys mullerian ducts will form uterus fallopian tubes cervix and upper two third of the vagina so whenever in the case of mullerian agenesis whenever there is no mullerian duct is females are not going to have uterus fallopian tube cervix and upper two third of vagina okay so can she have normal menstrual cycles no this female is not going to have a normal menstrual cycles so this female by the age of 14 15 by the time of puberty she is going to present in the clinic with a chief complaint of primary amenorrhea or chief complaint of not attaining the menarche okay now what about the secondary sexual characters in this female of mullerian agenesis guys secondary sexual characters are they present yes they are absolutely present why because the fetal or i should say the adrenal glands in this female okay the adrenal glands in, in this female they are functional they are producing the androgens okay weak androgens and these androgens are responsible for the formation of pubic hair and axillary hair so pubic hair formation axillary hair formation normally present and this females with mullerian agenesis they are not having the derivatives of mullerian duct but ovaries are present important mcq ovary development in a female with mullerian agenesis is normal why because ovaries they are not a products of mullerian ducts ovaries are derivatives of a genital ridge okay so genital ridge is absolutely normal genital ridge is 
forming the ovaries and these ovaries are functional they are making the estrogens and these estrogens will cause the breast development in this female so breast development is normal axillary hair development is normal pubic hair development is normal the only problem with this female is not attaining menarche menses are not there okay so that's what the problem is so now our female is 46 xx absolutely female and she is having a female phenotype okay what does i mean by female phenotype she is having normal vulva okay normal vulva why because this is a female no androgens automatically the default external genitalia is female so phenotype is female what's the problem the problem is complete degeneration of the mullerian ducts so there is absence of the uterus absence of fallopian tube and absence of upper two third of vagina okay now what about the other organ system anomalies guys please understand something like this see if mullerian ducts are not developing do you think that only mullerian ducts will not develop the surrounding regions may also not develop properly or for example as i every time say for example imagine that there is a bomb blast do you think that there will be one specific area will be destroyed no the surrounding area will also destroy in the same way in this condition of mullerian agenesis not only mullerian ducts will be affected certain other embryological structures can be affected so there can be associated renal anomalies like renal agenesis or half shoe kidney or hemivertebrae scoliosis and cardiac anomalies can be seen in these females with the mullerian agenesis please concentrate guys what is the chief complaint the chief complaint is primary amenorrhea are not attaining the mean are now what about the secondary sexual characters i have already discussed that breast development pubic hair development and axillary hair development are absolutely normal now if you do the physical examination that's a for example the rectal examination so what can you see vagina is felt like a blind pouch why there is a simple shallow depression why because there is only lower one third of vagina why because the urogenital sinus is going to form the lower one third of vagina so what you can feel is only the lower one third of vagina as the mullerian ducts are gone there is non development of upper two third of vagina so what you can feel is a blind pouch okay now if you do ultrasonography can you see uterus cervix fallopian tubes and upper two third of vagina no there is absence of uterus fallopian tube cervix and upper two third of vagina now what can we do for this female what can we do is vaginoplasty okay why because see she is having a simple blind pouched vagina there is a shallow depression now she cannot able to have a normal intercourse after marriage so what we can do here is vaginoplasty okay so that she can have a normal intercourse after her marriage now what about her uterus fallopian tubes uh, cervix can we do a replacement of these organs or can we do uh, like a transplantation of uterus is it possible no we are not going to do that for her to become mother there is no need of uterus because she is having intact ovaries ovaries are absolutely normal if her ovaries are absolutely normal she is going to make the ova and we can collect this ova and we can fertilize it with the partner sperm so that we are going to do the in vitro fertilization and we are going to transfer this embryo or this zygote into the surrogate mother so she can have a biological child but she is not going to have the child bearing as there is no uterus child bearing is not possible but she can be a biological mother okay for an mcq that females with mrkh syndrome okay mrkh means meyer rokitansky kirchner hauser syndrome which is simply called as mullerian agenesis or mrkh syndrome they can have a biological offspring because of normal ovarian function ovaries are there they develop from genital ridges not the mullerian ducts okay important mc q i know i am repeating because they are keep on repeatedly asking the exams okay now so they should undergo the adopt for the surrogacy to have a biological offspring 
okay now after mullerian agenesis let's discuss about a very interesting condition which is known as a testicular feminization syndrome which is also known as androgen insensitivity syndrome in the name itself very clear that androgens are insensitive or androgens are non functional so what's happening in this condition there is this male child male embryo and in this male embryo there is this y chromosome sry gene is present so that there is testis now this testis is it's functional now the serotonin cells which are present in this testis they are making the mullerian inhibiting factor something normally and this mullerian inhibiting factor is going to cause the regression of the mullerian ducts mullerian ducts are regressed okay now as the mullerian ducts are regressed uterus fallopian tubes cervix and upper vagina they are not getting formed in a male something normal so this half of the slide this part of the flow chart is something normal and this should happen in a male embryo okay male fetus this should happen now what about the other half of the flow chart this is the place where problem lies see the leading cells which are present in this testis they are making the testosterone okay well and good now this testosterone is a non functional testosterone this testosterone is a unable to act on the receptors or i should say this testosterone is unable to stimulate the testosterone receptors so it just simply looking like a condition where there is no testosterone okay if it is unable to stimulate the receptors then what is the use of this testosterone it just simply looking like there is no testosterone at all now what happens with the wolfian duct just tell me wolfian duct development needs a testosterone if there is no testosterone if there is no testosterone now wolfian duct will undergo regression if wolfian ducts are regressed the male internal reproductive organs they are not going to form so epididymis seminal vesicles seminiferous tubules prostatic urethra vas deferens all the structures which are supposed to form in a male now they are not developing okay well and good what about the external genitalia see for the development of external genitalia you need to have conversion of a testosterone into dihydrotestosterone see here they are non functional testosterone see whenever there is this non functional testosterone is not going to convert into this dihydrotestosterone also so if there is no dihydrotestosterone what happens guys by default okay whenever there is no functional testosterone by default the external genitalia will become female so now in this male child it's because of the non functional androgens the external genitalia they are becoming female like so a male is going to burn okay this male is going to burn with the vulva okay the labia minora labia majora clitoris all the structures are going to be seen by the time of birth so this child was confused this male child was confused with a female the doctor is going to announce that you have a female child to the parents okay and this baby was raised as a female why because it's very clear that external genitalia are absolutely female so who will think that this is a male child who is having non functional androgens and because of the non functional androgens the external genitalia are becoming female like who thinks like that just by looking at the genitalia the doctor is going to announce to the parents that your child is a female and now this child who is actually a male okay genetically a male is raised as a female now by the time this child attains puberty this child will have the breast development yes this male child who is raised as a female will develop the breast tissue why why because see please concentrate does this male child have testosterone or not yes testosterone is there but it is non functional now what happens is this testosterone in the body all this testosterone in the body it is getting peripherally aromatized with the help of enzyme aromatase with the help of enzyme aromatase in the adipose tissue 
all this testosterone is getting converted into estrogens now there are lots and lots of uh, peripheral aromatization happening all the testosterone is getting converted into estrogens so there is high levels of estrogens and this high level of estrogen will cause the breast development in this child okay a male child raised as a female and this male child who is raised as a female is now developing the breast breast is there the external genitalia is absolutely female like but what about the menses now does this male child who is raised as a female does she have menses no there is a no menarche why there is no menarche why because there is absence of uterus fallopian tubes cervix and upper vagina okay see there are these testes in this female okay testes are present intra abdominally okay so testes are present intra abdominally and this testes is producing the mullerian inhibiting factor and this mullerian inhibiting factor during the embryological life have caused the regression of the mullerian tract so there is no uterus no fallopian tubes no cervix and no upper two third of the vagina so there is no menses as there is no uterus no menarche but breast development is there okay now the question is what about the secondary sexual characters like axillary hair development and pubic hair development guys this is the area which is very very important why because from here you will get a question now guys please concentrate that the axillary hair development and pubic hair development they are testosterone dependent or androgen dependent now in this a female child there is this testosterone but it is non functional testosterone it is unable to stimulate its receptors now do you think that this child will have the development of axillary hair and pubic hair no axillary hair development and pubic hair development is not there okay because of a non functional testosterone so this is a very very important point breast development is present the external genitalia is absolutely female like but the secondary sexual characters are not developed okay and the female is going to present to your clinic with a chief complaint of amenorrhea primary amenorrhea okay now let's continue our topic now testicular feminization syndrome is a condition where the karyotype is 46xy which means it's a male okay genetically it's a male now what about the phenotype phenotype is all about the external genitalia okay external genitalia is looking absolutely like a female okay now what about the bar body guys bar body is something which is present in a female fetus okay out of two x chromosomes one x chromosome will undergo lineization or inactivation so a bar body is something which is present in a female child but this is a male child looking like a female so bar body is absent okay see this testicular feminization syndrome is also known as androgen insensitivity syndrome we have already discussed that now what are the clinical features the female is going to have a primary amenorrhea because of the absence of uterus cervix okay and fallopian tubes normal breast development is there okay because of the peripheral aromatization now under developed or absence of the pubic and axillary hair okay secondary sexual characters are not developed because of non functional testosterone okay guys this is a very important mcq see uh, these uh, females who are actually males these females are going to present to the clinic with a chief complaint of primary amenorrhea but they can also present in your clinic with a complaint of inguinal hernia why see this inguinal hernia is nothing but the undescended testes which got blocked in the inguinal canal guys see testes okay like uh, in intra uterine like they are intra abdominal organs okay testes are formed in the abdomen we all know that the testosterone will act on the gubernoculum testes so there will be descent of this testes into scrotum important point sir descent of testes into scrotum is done by gubernoculum testes and for this descent testosterone is must now in this condition testes are formed true but the testosterone which is inactive or the testosterone which is non functional is not acting on the gubernoculum testes 
so the descent of testis is not happening into the scrotum so now these testis are left inside the abdomen or sometimes these testis will find in the inguinal canal leading to inguinal hernia so inguinal hernia is due to undescended testis okay so what are the laboratory finding guys laboratory findings may show high to normal levels of a testosterone what are the ultrasonographic findings if you do ultrasonography in this female who is actually male i'm repeating okay every time we should we wish it's genetically a male but looking like a female okay so we are not sure whether to call this a male or a female okay now ultrasonographic findings show absence of a uterus absence of fallopian tubes and cervix and sometimes you may find intra abdominal testis sometimes they might be also present in the inguinal canal or sometimes you may also find these testis under the labia okay so the external genitalia labia under the labia you might also find these swellings these swellings are nothing but the testis which are undescended okay now after this what can we do for this females of a testicular feminization syndrome guys what you can do is a vaginoplasty why vaginoplasty why because see there are no mullerian ducts first of all there are no mullerian ducts mullerian ducts cause got completely regressed so the upper two third of vagina which are derivative of mullerian duct they are not there so there is only shallow vagina there is only shallow blind pouch vagina there is only shallow dimpling so with the shallow vagina she cannot participate in the intercourse so what you can offer her is vaginoplasty okay so just before marriage you can do vaginoplasty mcq okay after this what about the testis in this female okay the testis the intra abdominal organs what can you do with this testis should you have to remove them yes you should remove them why because these intra abdominal testis they are at a risk of developing the malignancy that is like a gonadoblastoma benign stage and dysgerminoma so this intra abdominal testis should be removed but when they should be removed see you have to remove them only after attainment of a puberty okay please concentrate the testis should be removed only after puberty why only after puberty why not before puberty somewhere around 10 or 8 years why not or why not immediately after like a delivery if, you, if the uh, diagnosis of testicular feminization syndrome is confirmed why not before puberty why because see this testis which are intra abdominal they are the only source of estrogens this testis is forming the testosterone and this testosterone is getting converted into estrogens and now this estrogens are the only one which cause the breast development in this female so if you take out this testis you are just simply knocking out the production of testosterone and there is no estrogens at all if there is no estrogens there is no breast development so before puberty if you take out the testis means you are taking out the source of estrogens now she won't develop the breast so in order to have the breast development you have to remove this testis only after the attainment of puberty after the breast is completely formed you can take out this testis to prevent the malignancy so intra abdominal testis should be removed as there is a risk of a gonadoblastoma and dysgenoma okay now see these females should be kept on hormone replacement therapy to prevent the osteoporosis why why because you have taken out this intra abdominal testis now if you take out this testis you have removed the source for the estrogens you have taken out the source of estrogens whenever there are no estrogens we all know that the osteoclasts in this female body okay the osteoclasts in these bones they will be activated and they will cause like too much amount of bone resorption that will cause osteoporosis so to prevent osteoporosis what you can do is hormone replacement therapy you should replace the estrogens so to prevent the bones from osteoporosis so estrogen replacement therapy is given okay now guys important points are the female with the testicular feminization syndrome is actually a male 
a female with testicular feminization syndrome will have normal breast development but the secondary sexual characters like axillary hair development and pubic hair development are absent okay now after this please concentrate the main important differences between the mrkh syndrome that is a mullerian agenesis and androgen insensitivity syndrome guys this slide is very very important if you want to answer a clinical question you should know this a table a very good okay now see, the phenotype in mrkh is a 46 xx which means something normal female now what about the as guys it is 46 xy okay there is y chromosome it's actually a male now what about the gonads the gonads here in this mrkh are ovaries and the gonads in androgen insensitivity syndrome is the they are testes now what's the chief complaint guys guys this is very very important both the conditions are going to present to the clinic with a chief complaint of a primary amenorrhea both the conditions are going to present with the primary amenorrhea okay both they will say doctor we are not having the menses okay now what about the external genitalia guys external genitalia is vulva here also vulva what about the vagina guys if you have performed the, the digital rectal examination the vagina is shallow here even shallow here both the conditions are shallow now what about the secondary sexual characters guys important mcq in mrkh syndrome the secondary sexual characters are developed okay but in androgen insensitivity syndrome as the testosterone is a non functional the secondary sexual characters like axillary hair development and pubic hair development is undeveloped or underdeveloped okay now what about the breast development in mrkh syndrome the breasts are absolutely normal they are developed and even in androgen insensitivity syndrome the breasts are developed and even you have a bigger size breast okay tanner size breast four tanner size four see breast development is something normal but a child of 14 15 year old having a tanner size four breast is something not normal lots and lots of peripheral aromatization happening in the condition of androgen insensitivity syndrome so all the testosterone is getting converted into estrogens and these estrogens are making a bigger breast okay now what about the ultrasonographic findings see if you have performed ultrasonography the uterus cervix fallopian tubes all are absent okay and here also uterus cervix fallopian tubes are absent here in mrkh it's because of the mullerian agenesis all the mullerian derivatives are not formed and in androgen insensitivity syndrome it's there is this y chromosome because of the y chromosome there is this testes and in the testes there are these uh, serotonin cells and these serotonin cells are making mullerian inhibiting factor and that mullerian inhibiting factor is going to cause regression of the mullerian ducts so mullerian derivatives like uterus cervix fallopian tubes are absent now guys this is a very very important area that's the testosterone guys in a mrkh syndrome this is a normal female okay normal female now in a normal female there will be normal female range androgens okay 22 18 nanograms per deciliter this is a normal female range testosterone but see the condition of androgen insensitivity syndrome the androgen levels are male range okay this is male right so male range testosterone will be present in the condition of androgen insensitivity syndrome okay so these are the major differences between the two now after this let's see some clinical cases okay there is this 15 year old girl who was brought to the opd with the chief complaint of primary amenorrhea if, I, if i'm saying primary amenorrhea even the mrkh patients and androgen insensitivity patients both of them are going to present with the primary amenorrhea first thing now there is no history of cyclical abdominal pain see this word cyclical abdominal pain should remind you about a condition known as a cryptomenorrhea okay see cyclical abdominal pain means every month she is having this abdominal pain and this abdominal pain may be because of the hidden menstruation see if she is having transverse vaginal septum or if she is having imperforate hymen now she is not having menses outside but inside she is having all these things okay normal menstrual cycle is going on 
but they are not coming out this menstrual blood is not coming out so now in our females there is no history of cyclical abdominal pain which means i can exclude these things like cryptomenorrhea okay now on examination breast development was normal secondary sec uh, sexual characters are normal breast development is there okay secondary sexual characters are normal that is pubic hair development and axillary hair development but uterus cervix are not felt on per rectal examination what is the next step in the investigation what you should do now this is our female with the complaint of primary amenorrhea now what we should do here there is a sentence uterus and cervix are not felt on per rectal examination now guys please try to answer the questions based on the given information and the given options so within the given options you should choose a better option now you should do karyotyping or not or you should do uh, gonadotropin levels or you should check uh, like you know pelvic organs by pelvic ultrasound or mri the best option which you can do here is pelvic ultrasound why because see uterus and cervix are not felt on per rectal examination you have done the physical examination which are not felt so now let's confirm that uterus and cervix are not present like we have to confirm them first by pelvic ultrasound most of the guys will think let's go for the karyotyping no no you are not supposed to do the karyotyping why because karyotyping it takes a lot of time and it's very expensive so doing ultrasound it's a matter of hers okay it's a matter of hers within hers you can know that this female is having this internal reproductive organs or not if internal reproductive organs are not there then you can go for the further studies like karyotyping or not but now within a matter of time very easily you can know that the internal reproductive organs are present or not so the better option you can go for is pelvic ultrasound okay now guys let's see this question same question in a different way a 15 year old girl was brought to the opd with a chief complaint of primary amenorrhea yes same like you know same information no history of cyclical abdominal pain which means i can exclude the cryptomenorrhea or not examination shows uterus and cervix are absent now it's very clearly said uterus cervix are absent what is the next step in the investigation guys now i am getting a doubt here see primary amenorrhea okay primary amenorrhea is there uterus cervix not there okay primary amenorrhea uterus and cervix are not there now in the condition of mullerian agenesis this female with mullerian agenesis is going to present to the clinic with primary amenorrhea if you do ultrasonography in ultrasonography uterus cervix upper two third of vagina fallopian tube all the structures are absent in mullerian agenesis too but also in androgen insensitivity syndrome uterus cervix and upper two third of vagina is also absent now how to differentiate between these two okay how can i simply differentiate between these two conditions how means should i have to go for the karyotyping yes karyotype will differentiate between androgen insensitivity syndrome and mullerian agenesis but karyotyping is a time taking and it is also expensive so now the next best step is not karyotype karyotype can differentiate mrkh with the mullerian agenesis mullerian agenesis is, is 46 xx and androgen insensitivity syndrome is 46 x5 it can differentiate but not now okay now gonadotropin levels not much information you will get with the gonadotropin levels now serum testosterone yes serum testosterone you can go for why why because see if it is mrkh the testosterone levels will be of male range sorry not male range female range that is 20 to 80 nanograms per deciliter okay if it is mrkh less amount of testosterone will be there but if it is androgen insensitivity syndrome where you will have 200 to 800 nanograms per deciliter so now it's very simple right so just a laboratory test okay we will get the results within hours so 
serum testosterone is the next best step in investigation now if you are getting lots and lots of testosterone now you can order for the karyotype okay later but now the best investigation is serum testosterone okay now after this let's see this question a 15 year old girl was brought to the opd with a chief complaint of again primary amenorrhea no history of cyclical abdominal pain examination shows the uterus and cervix are absent what is the next step in investigation okay now please see the options karyotype gonadotropin levels pelvic ultrasound mri see what we will do with the mri mri doesn't give you much information like you know already it's very clear that uterus cervix they are not there after doing mri much information you are not going to get pelvic ultrasound same it's already clearly given that uterus cervix are not there so what you will get with the pelvic ultrasound gonadotropin levels i have already said much information you won't get so now according to the given options the best will be karyotyping see here testosterone levels is not there in the options so that's the reason why i am choosing the karyotype okay so based on the given options so you should change your best answer okay so these are some important clinical cases regarding mrkh syndrome and androgen insensitivity syndrome how to differentiate between these two cases both the cases are primary amenorrhea both are the cases of primary amenorrhea both of them doesn't have internal reproductive organs okay but one is a male other is a female okay so these are how to differentiate between these two conditions now let's talk about the sphere syndrome guys from now we are going to discuss about a topic known as gonadal dysgenesis okay now please concentrate that sphere syndrome is an example of a gonadal dysgenesis so what exactly happening in this condition of gonadal dysgenesis guys see we are going to take a male embryo which means like this sphere syndrome is going to happen for the male child now in this male embryo there is this y chromosome present and because of this y chromosome there is a development of the testicular tissue but The, what is the name of the topic guys gonadal dysgenesis the gonads are dysgenetic which means the gonads are non functional gonads so this testis is a non functional now if it is non functional the sertoli cells are also non functional if sertoli cells are not functional means the mullerian inhibiting factor is not getting produced if mullerian inhibiting factor is not produced in a male fetus means what happens now this mullerian ducts are going to express in a male fetus so a male a mullerian ducts are getting expressed so the derivatives of the mullerian ducts are going to be seen in this male child so a male child is going to develop uterus fallopian tubes cervix and upper vagina so a male is developing the internal female reproductive organs yes now let's come to the other half of the flow chart now as the testis is non functional in nature the leydig cells are also not functional if leydig cells are not functional they are not going to make the testosterone if there are no testosterone in this male what happens usually if a duct need testosterone for its expression whenever testosterone is not there wolfian duct will undergo regression if wolfian duct undergo regression the male internal genitalia or the male internal reproductive organs are not developed what about the external genitalia we all know that basic human genitalia is female like for the conversion of female genitalia into male genitalia you need to have testosterone now in this condition testosterone is there no testosterone is not there so automatically by default the external genitalia will become female so this male is having internal female reproductive organs okay and also female external genitalia so anyone think that this is a male child or female child 
everyone will think that by the time of birth this is a female child and raised as a female child but in fact it is genotypically and karyotypically this is a male child with female internal and external genitalia okay now let's see the important differences between mrkh eis and swear syndrome we have already discussed the differences between mrkh and eis now let's see one point one by one important points about the swear syndrome swear syndrome phenotypically it's a female why because it's having external female genitalia because of the absence of testosterone karyotype is 46 xy okay there is y chromosome actually it's a male now the gonads are testis yes testis are there but they are non functional dysgenetic gonadal dysgenesis now what is the chief complaint again primary amenorrhea okay so these uh, females are also going to come to the clinic with a chief complaint of primary amenorrhea why primary amenorrhea guys you might ask me that swear syndrome is a condition where there is uterus fallopian tube cervix and upper vagina so she can have a normal menses no see in order to have a normal menstrual cycle simple presence of uterus fallopian tube cervix is not enough she also need to have the ovaries but this is a male chick ovaries are not there if ovaries are not there do you think that this female is going to have normal menses no so she is going to have primary amenorrhea okay see all these three conditions are going to present with the primary amenorrhea so that's why it's very important to differentiate between mrkh as and swear syndrome now what about the external genitalia guys in all these conditions the external genitalia is vulva okay that is a female form now what about the vagina guys the vagina here is normal why vagina is normal guys okay the lower one third okay the lower one third of vagina which is coming from the urogenital sinus is normally coming but the upper two third of vagina which is a derivative of mullerian duct is also normal in the swear syndrome why because swear syndrome is a condition please concentrate swear syndrome is a condition where the mullerian ducts are developed normally so the upper vagina okay the upper vagina is normally developed because of the absence of testosterone the lower one third of vagina is also normally developed from the urogenital sinus so the vagina in a female with swear syndrome is normal what about the secondary sexual characters guys the secondary sexual characters are undeveloped why undeveloped why because see swear syndrome is a condition with the dysgenetic gonads if the gonads are dysgenetic the testosterone production is not there if testosterone is not there means the pubic hair and axillary hair development is not there so pubic and axillary hair development is undeveloped what about the breast guys here very important see mullerian agenesis mrkh is a syndrome where the breast is normally developed ais is a condition where there are larger breast but what about the swear syndrome swear syndrome even the breasts are not developed why she is having primary amenorrhea primary amenorrhea and also breasts are undeveloped why breasts are undeveloped why because there are no ovaries first of all in this condition testosterone is not there if testosterone is not there there is no possibility for the peripheral aromatization at least remember at least in as testosterone is there though it is a non functional testosterone is there in as and it is peripherally getting aromatized to estrogens and because of that estrogens now a female with androgen insensitivity syndrome now she is having the bigger breasts but here in swear syndrome because of dysgenetic gonads there are no testosterone whenever there is no testosterone there is no peripheral aromatization whenever there is no peripheral aromatization there is no chance of estrogens and breast development is underdeveloped or undeveloped okay now what about the ultrasonographic findings guys guys very very important mullerian agenesis or mrkh uterus cervix fallopian tubes are absent 
androgen insensitivity syndrome again here also uterus cervix fallopian tubes are absent but what about the swer syndrome swer syndrome mullerian duct is expressed so uterus cervix fallopian tubes are present okay so this is all about the swer syndrome now what you can do here guys important points about the swer syndrome are also like just like the androgen insensitivity syndrome even here in swer syndrome the testes are intra abdominal and they are at a risk of developing gonadoblastoma and dysgeminoma so for a swer syndrome patient you need to do prophylactic gonadectomy okay that gonad should be removed why because if those gonads are intra abdominal they will develop the malignancy okay second thing you need to give estrogens for her to develop the breast okay she also need to be kept on hormone replacement therapy so that she won't be developing the osteoporosis okay so this is all about the swer syndrome now after swer syndrome let's talk about the turner syndrome which is also a type of gonadal dysgenesis guys what exactly is gonadal dysgenesis gonadal dysgenesis is a condition where the gonads are not functional right even in turner syndrome we all know the gonads okay turner syndrome is something happening in a female even in turner syndrome the gonads are dysgenetic so the ovaries are just like a sliver of tissue okay the streak gonads we used to call that streak gonads so turner syndrome is a type of gonadal dysgenesis now what's the most common karyotype of turner guys the most common karyotype is 46 xo that is monosomy x which means one x chromosome is missing okay one x is lost so the missing x is mostly paternal in origin okay see what actually should happen if it is a female x x one x should be from the mother and one x should be from the father what's happening here the sperm is missing one x okay sperm is not carrying one x so it became x zero so missing x is mostly paternal in nature and the important point is that there is no increased risk of turner syndrome with increased maternal age we used to say with increased maternal age there is risk of down syndrome and other trisomies but here with increase in maternal age there is no risk of turner syndrome okay important point now this is uh, the image they will give you in the exam and uh, they will ask you this karyotype is showing which disease guys please concentrate that there is only one x chromosome and the other x chromosome is absent so it is a 45x0 okay now guys the most common cause of primary amenorrhea is direct singular portions the most common cause of primary amenorrhea is gonadal dysgenesis and which type of gonadal dysgenesis guys turner syndrome okay means ovaries are non functional if the ovaries are non functional then how can you have the menses if the see it's the ovarian cycle which will override the uterine cycle what does i mean by ovarian events are going to bring the changes in the uterine events if ovaries are not functional then the endometrial proliferation and endometrial shedding in the uterus is not going to happen so non functional gonads are going to cause primary amenorrhea so out of all the causes of primary amenorrhea the most common cause is gonadal dysgenesis and which type of gonadal dysgenesis is turner syndrome where the ovaries are non functional because of the monosomy x a complete female is because of the 2x If there is only one X that causes gonadal dysgenesis. Okay, now Turner is a condition of. See, Turner syndrome is a condition of hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. What does I mean by? See, Turner is a condition where there is hypogonadism, which means the gonads are hypo. What does I mean by? Hypogonadism means. the ovaries are non functional am i true or not yes the ovaries are non functional if ovaries are non functional means they are not making the estrogens okay estrogens are very much low whenever there are no estrogens 
the hypothalamo pituitary ovarian axis what it will think that estrogens are not there so what the pituitary is going to do pituitary is going to release lots and lots of fsh okay in order to stimulate the ovaries see ovaries usually have to produce the estrogens now in this condition of turner syndrome ovaries are non functional so estrogens are not there if estrogens are not there the pituitary gland is trying to produce this estrogens at any cost so it is producing lots and lots of fsh in order to stimulate this ovaries so that the ovaries will make the estrogens but the ovaries are not functional so that's the reason why we are calling this condition as hypergonadotropic means gonadotropic hormones are very much higher what is that gonadotropic hormone nothing but the fsh hypergonadotropic hypogonadism which means the gonads are non functional hypogonads okay so very important mcq turner is a condition of hypergonadotropic hypogonadism now please concentrate all these are the clinical features in a female with a turner syndrome let's see one by one guys please concentrate that having two x chromosomes will make a complete female if one x chromosome is lost then that female who is going to have is going to be half female so please concentrate if two x chromosomes are there normal height will be there if only one x chromosome is there the female will be short okay short statured important mcq the female will be short statured when compared to a normal female she is short statured now complete female 2x normal normal breast development will be there now this female is going to have shield like chest okay with the widely spaced nipples okay widely spaced nipples shield like chest will be there and now if you concentrate on this area okay neck area there will be webbing of the neck okay webbing of the neck and this females this turn of females will have low posterior hairline okay the hairline will be much lower see turn females you can say that the female is having turner syndrome just by looking why because there are lots and lots of morphological features which will give you signs that this female is a turner female they are short stature webbing neck will be there widely spaced nipples broad shield like chest will be there okay now she can have a harsh shoe kidney please concentrate the ovaries are dysgenetic rudimentary ovaries which means gonadal dysgenesis non functional so there are streaky ovaries okay streak ovaries will be there now these females are also associated with certain cardiac anomalies like bicuspid aortic valve mcq okay so they can they can have this bicuspid aortic valve and also coarctation of aorta but most common is bicuspid aortic valve is most common okay most common cardiac anomaly which is seen with the turners is bicuspid aortic valve they may also have coarctation of aorta see they have this skeletal abnormalities like cubitus valgus okay see the elbows are more outward okay cubitus valgus will be there and the fourth metacarpal is short okay these are the features of a turner syndrome important mcq is these turner females most of the time they will have a normal intelligence iq will be normal these are the very important points to know about the turner female during infancy okay the female just born okay this turner female she just born at the time of her birth she might also present with this cystic hygroma okay cystic hygroma okay she may also have this cystic hygroma on her neck and that in the later life will present as the webbing neck okay webbed neck so these are all the a uh, features clinical features of the turner female who have this gonadal dysgenesis now after this let's see some important points about why a turner female is a short okay see there is a lot of information this i have taken from an article but few important points which you need to know are see on the x chromosome on the x chromosome there is a region known as par 1 okay pseudo autosomal region 1 
Now this PAR1 is present on the short arm of X chromosome. Now in this region there is a gene called as SHOX gene. Okay, short stature home box containing gene. This PAR1 region is there. And in this region of the X chromosome there is a gene called SHOX gene. Okay. Now this SHOX gene is very important because it is expressed in the limbs, pharyngeal arches, osteogenic cells and bone marrow and this is very much important in the development of skeletal growth. Okay, it's very much important in the formation of the skeleton. Now because of the loss of X chromosome, this SHOX gene is also lost. If you lose this shock gene, you will have skeletal abnormalities. So your skeleton may be a short statured skeleton. So the reason why Turner female is short is because of the shock gene loss of the X chromosome. See X chromosome itself is lost. So shock gene is lost. So that's the reason why the female is a short statured and she have this cubitus valgus and short foot metacarpal and all these stuff is because of loss of that shock gene. Okay, so we have discussed all the important points about the Swer syndrome and Turner syndrome. Both are the examples for the gonadal dysgenesis. Now after seeing why a Turner female is short, now let's discuss other conditions of intersex. The condition which we are going to discuss is a congenital adrenal hypoplasia. It's an autosomal recessive disorder where a karyotypically female, okay, karyotypically she is a female, but looks like a male, phenotypically it looks like this female, phenotypically looks like a male, okay. So let's see why a female looks like a male. We have seen conditions where a male is looking like a female, like androgen insensitivity syndrome, Swer syndrome. Androgen insensitivity syndrome, Swer syndrome, these two conditions are examples of a male looking like a female. Now, this congenital adrenal hypoplasia is a condition where a female looks like a male. Okay, let's see. Guys, this slide is totally depicting the steroidogenesis, okay, or corticosteroid production in the adrenal gland, okay. See, this flowchart is entirely depicting different hormone production like aldosterone, cortisol, and dihydroxytestosterone, estradiol. See, all these hormones are getting produced in the adrenal glands. This slide is a bit complex. Okay, now I will explain this topic of congenital adrenal hypoplasia in a simple way. But before that, why exactly congenital adrenal hypoplasia is happening? Why? Why? Because there is a deficiency of certain enzymes. Deficiency of 21 hydroxylase is the most common MCQ. The most common enzyme deficiency for developing congenital adrenal hypoplasia is 21 hydroxylase deficiency. But also deficiency of 11 hydroxylase, 11 beta hydroxylase and 3 beta hydroxy, 3 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency can also cause a different forms of congenital adrenal hypoplasia. But most common enzyme deficiency is 21 hydroxylase deficiency. Okay. Now let's explain the entire thing in a simple way. Okay. Please concentrate that hypothalamus is going to produce a hormone called corticotropic releasing hormone. So hypothalamus is producing CRH. This corticotropic releasing hormone, it is coming to the anterior pituitary and stimulate the corticotropes in the anterior pituitary. Now the corticotropes in the anterior pituitary are going to release the ACTH adrenocorticotropic hormone. ACTH is getting produced. Now what this ACTH is doing? This ACTH is acting on the adrenal gland and the adrenal gland whenever it is acted upon by ACTH, the cholesterol in the adrenal gland is converted into pregnenolone. Okay, cholesterol is getting converted into pregnenolone and this pregnenolone it will be converted into 17 hydroxy progesterone. Now this is 17 hydroxy progesterone it will go into three different pathways. 
what are three different pathways guys this 17 hydroxy progesterone it can be converted into aldosterone it can be converted into cortisol and it can be converted into androgens okay there are three pathways into which this 17 hydroxy progesterone can go important point is that the main remember the main aim of this acth is not aldosterone production or not the androgen production the reason why acth is there is for the production of cortisol the main aim of acth is the cortisol production so what happens acth came at the at the end cortisol is there now what this cortisol is doing this cortisol will give the negative feedback for the acth saying that enough cortisol is there there is no need of acth again so this cortisol is giving the negative feedback to the pituitary gland so that pituitary gland will decrease the acth production this is something normal but what's happening in congenital adrenal hyperplasia very simple please concentrate here in congenital adrenal hyperplasia this 21 hydroxylase enzyme is not there and 11 hydroxylase enzyme is not there so what happens important remember see for the production of aldosterone and cortisol remember for the production of aldosterone and cortisol you need to have 21 hydroxylase and 11 hydroxylase okay these two enzymes are needed for the production of aldosterone and cortisol whenever these enzymes are not present in the condition of congenital adrenal hyperplasia aldosterone cannot be produced cortisol cannot be produced so cortisol is not there that's the main important thing whenever cortisol is not there what happens the negative feedback to the anterior pituitary is lost so there is no negative feedback whenever there is no negative feedback the anterior pituitary is going to produce lots of acth and this lots of acth is going to stimulate the adrenal gland so what happens adrenal gland is stimulated more stimulation so there is adrenal hyperplasia so why there is adrenal hyperplasia guys this adrenal hyperplasia is because of excessive stimulation by the acth why there is excessive acth because there is no cortisol no negative feedback so now what's happening when the adrenal gland is so much stimulated the cholesterol in the adrenal gland is so much getting converted into pregnenolone there is too much amount of pregnenolone and all that pregnenolone is getting converted into 17 hydroxy progesterone so now there is lots and lots of 17 hydroxy progesterone now my question is can this 17 hydroxy progesterone go into pathway of aldosterone no the 17 hydroxy progesterone cannot go into the pathway of aldosterone why because there is no 21 hydroxylase or 11 hydroxylase okay so there is because of the deficiency of these enzymes aldosterone cannot be formed in the same way these two enzymes are also needed for the formation of cortisol so even cortisol is not getting produced so all this 17 hydroxy progesterone is now shunted towards the production of the androgens all this 17 hydroxy progesterone is now going into the pathway of androgens so totally all this 17 hydroxy progesterone is used up for the production of androgens so there are lots and lots of androgens in this condition okay now what happens all these androgens are going to cause virilization here you need to understand guys for example if congenital adrenal hyperplasia is happening in a male child for example there is a male fetus and in this male fetus there is deficiency of this 21 hydroxylase and 11 hydroxylase in the male fetus there will be too much amount of androgens then that won't be a bigger issue okay it won't be a bigger problem if male have too much amount of this adrenal androgens why because males anyway have these androgens but the problem is with the female fetus see if a female fetus if she have this congenital adrenal hyperplasia all that 17 hydroxy progesterone is used for the formation of 
androgens and now this excessive androgen levels during her infancy will what it will do this androgens will convert the external genitalia into male like we have already discussed right if there is androgens during intra uterine life or like you no know, embryonal life the embryological structures are going to convert into male external genitalia so now in this condition we are having excessive amount of androgens and because of this excessive amount of androgens now this female will undergo virilization which means her clitoris okay her clitoris is going to increase in size causing clitoromegaly and this clitoromegaly will look like small penis that is the reason why this a female child will look like a male because of this clitoromegaly it will something look like ambiguous genitalia it won't look like a complete male genitalia because of this excessive androgens there will be fusion of the labia okay there will be a fusion of labia majora okay so labia majora they will be partially fused it just looks like a scrotum okay and the clitoris will enlarge which just look like a small penis okay so that's the reason why this female will look like a male so there will be development of ambiguous ambiguous genitalia okay so congenital adrenal hyperplasia is a condition of a ambiguous genitalia okay now guys important mcq is that what are the levels of 17 hydroxy progesterone in congenital adrenal hyperplasia in the condition of congenital adrenal hyperplasia the 17 hydroxy progesterone levels are elevated we have already discussed because of the excessive stimulation by the acth the adrenal gland the all the cholesterol is getting converted into 17 hydroxy progesterone and all this 17 hydroxy progesterone will be getting converted into androgens so what about the levels of 17 hydroxy progesterone elevated see if you are trying to do the screening for the congenital adrenal hyperplasia okay you just you are suspecting that this baby is having congenital adrenal hyperplasia or not then what you will do is you can measure the 17 hydroxy progesterone levels why because if it is a condition of cah the 17 hydroxy progesterone levels are so high okay if the 17 hydroxy progesterone levels are less than 200 okay nanograms per deciliter you no need to think about cah okay see cah diagnosis is excluded by because if it is a cah there will be lots and lots of 17 hydroxy progesterone okay and if the range is between 200 to 800 nanograms per deciliter then you can go for acth stimulation test but if the test uh, 17 hydroxy progesterone levels are more than 800 nanograms per deciliter it is very clear that this is a condition of a congenital adrenal hyperplasia so at the end i just want you to remember one point that is congenital adrenal hyperplasia is a condition where there is increased levels of 17 hydroxy progesterone okay now please concentrate on this slide we have discussed everything now let's see what's exactly happening in the congenital adrenal hyperplasia c if there is a deficiency of this enzyme 21 hydroxylase i have already discussed that 21 hydroxylase is an enzyme which is needed both for the production of aldosterone and cortisol whenever there is no 21 hydroxylase there is no aldosterone no cortisol so the whole pathway is now shunted towards the androgen synthesis no there are lots and lots of androgens and because of this lots and lots of androgens now this female child is undergoing virilization so there will be development of ambiguous genitalia okay now please concentrate guys because of the absence of 21 hydroxylase whenever there is no aldosterone okay aldosterone production is getting decreased whenever there is no aldosterone what happens first of all what is the normal function of aldosterone aldosterone helps in the sodium and water retention okay 
aldosterone helps in reabsorbing the sodium and reabsorbing the water whenever there is no aldosterone salt is getting lost in the urine so there is hyponatremia salt is getting lost and even there is water loss salt water wasting is seen okay because of the loss of aldosterone now whenever the water is losing from the body and salt is losing from the body this baby may have this hypotension and one more function of aldosterone is aldosterone actually kicks out the potassium from the body okay aldosterone kicks out the potassium from the body so whenever there is decrease aldosterone potassium will accumulate in the body that will cause hyperkalemia so what i am trying to put into your mind is congenital adrenal hypoplasia is not only a condition of ambiguous genitalia but also a condition of electrolyte abnormalities and this electrolyte abnormalities can even kill the baby so important point is there is a variant okay there are variants of congenital adrenal hypoplasia like a classical variant salt losing variant in salt losing variant because of the loss of this electrolytes the baby is at a risk of death okay in a normal classical variant there will be only simple ambiguous genitalia if it is more severe form that is a salt wasting form where there is too much decrease in the aldosterone levels there will be electrolyte abnormalities and even this kill this out baby okay so that is the important point now let's see some other forms of congenital adrenal hypoplasia okay before saying some other forms okay let's discuss all the important points okay let's sum up all the important points the karyotype is 46 xx it's a female yes what are the ultrasonographic findings if you do ultrasonography this is a female right if it's a female uterus fallopian tubes cervix are present absolutely present uterus cervix fallopian tubes ovaries everything are normally present bar body is present females have bar body congenital adrenal hyperplasia is a condition of female pseudo hermaphroditism see this i will explain later okay please keep this point in mind this i will explain in the later slide what are the clinical features because of this excess androgens this female will have clitoromegaly here you can clearly see in this female child there is this labial fusion and they are just looking like a scrotum and the clitoris is enlarged and it just looking like a small penis so i can say there is a virilization in this female child okay male child too much androgens not a problem there might be precocious puberty in a male child but female child chance of virilization chance of ambiguous genitalia okay now the genital folds they will fuse and form the penile urethra the labia majora they will fuse and they just looks like a scrotum okay and because of the loss of mineralocorticoid that is aldosterone there can be this hyponatremia hyperkalemia hypotension okay we have already seen those points now what about the laboratory findings guys if it is the congenital adrenal hypoplasia if you do the screening test for the 17 hydroxy progesterone levels the 17 hydroxy progesterone levels are elevated more than 800 nanograms per deciliter the diagnosis is established that this is congenital adrenal hypoplasia okay now let's discuss about the treatment options for congenital adrenal hypoplasia what we can do guys in this a patient in this female there is this clitoromegaly and the labial fusion so what we can do is take out this penis looking clitoris so phallus should be removed and surgically we have to correct the vagina so vaginoplasty should be done in this female child okay now guys this female child is not having enough amount of mineralocorticoids and glucocorticoids so what we should do we should replace the mineralocorticoids and glucocorticoids for the mineralocorticoid replacement the drug which we are giving is a fludrocortisone okay so to replace the aldosterone we are giving the fludrocortisone and to replace the glucocorticoid that is cortisol we are giving 
hydrocortisone so for the treatment of congenital adrenal hypoplasia in a female to replace glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids we are giving fludrocortisone and hydrocortisone now the very important area in this slide is this okay see drug of choice for a female at the risk of having a baby with congenital adrenal hypoplasia what does i mean by there is a woman now she is pregnant previously she had a baby with a congenital adrenal hypoplasia now she is worrying that the upcoming child the new child may also have congenital adrenal hypoplasia so now as a doctor what you should do you should prevent congenital adrenal hypoplasia and virilization in the upcoming child now the question is if the upcoming child is a male is there is any problem no if the upcoming child is a female that too unaffected no problem if the upcoming child is a female and if this female is affected means then only it's a problem so how we should know whether the child is a male female unaffected or affected female how we can know we can know it by doing chorionic villus sampling by 10 to 13 weeks but important point is that we are not going to perform chorionic villus sampling to know whether it's a male child female unaffected or affected female why because chorionic villus sampling is done somewhere around 12 weeks but by 12 weeks already external genitalia are developed okay see even if it's a female child because of excessive androgens even a female child will undergo virilization and looks like a normal male child so we are not going to depend on the chorionic villus sampling to know what is the sex of the child and we are not going to do the treatment depend on the sex of the child what we are doing immediately at the time of diagnosis of the new pregnancy we are going to keep this female who are at a risk of giving birth to a female with congenital adrenal hypoplasia we are going to keep her on dexamethasone we are going to give dexamethasone to this mother this dexamethasone is going to cross the placental barrier and enters into the fetal circulation and this dexamethasone will suppress the acth production so whenever there is no acth there is no androgen production whenever there is no androgen production there is no risk of virilization so what we are doing to prevent virilization risk in the upcoming child we are going to give dexamethasone to the mother so this is the treatment drug of choice for a female who is at a risk of having a baby with congenital adrenal hypoplasia is dexamethasone and when we have to give this dexamethasone guys after 12 weeks after like confirming the sex no immediately after uh, like no uh, putting the diagnosis of pregnancy okay at the time of diagnosis of the pregnancy you have to give the dexamethasone immediately but it's better if you would have started before 9 weeks not after 9 weeks okay after 9 weeks there is no use right? because already external genitalia are formed best is immediately after diagnosis of pregnancy but not later than 9 weeks okay not after like you know uh, 12 weeks now we have started this mother on dexamethasone okay now what we are doing we are going to perform chorionic villus sampling at 12 weeks okay we will do chorionic villus sampling at 12 weeks now the result came that the growing baby is a male baby is there is any problem no if it's a male fetus or if the growing baby is a female that too it's a unaffected female the genes are absolutely normal now you would say unaffected female then also not a problem so what we can do we can stop dexamethasone to the mother stop the steroids if it is a unaffected female and male stop the steroids if it's a female fetus and that too if it's affected what we can do 
If it is an affected female, then what we can do is continue the dexamethasone throughout the pregnancy. Continue. Okay. So, till the delivery, we have to keep this woman on dexamethasone. Okay. So, this is the treatment very, very important for the exams. It, in different, different exams, they will be asking you. Okay. I am summing it up. In a normal female, okay, female with congenital adrenal hypoplasia, what is the treatment? Mineralocorticoid replacement, fludrocortisone, glucocorticoid replacement, hydrocortisone. But for the mother who is at risk of having a baby with CAH, it is dexamethasone immediately after diagnosis of pregnancy, that is during pregnancy test is coming positive, immediately put her on dexamethasone. Okay, so this is the treatment and we have to continue this treatment till the delivery. Okay, and even in this image, you can clearly see that the, there is this clitoromegaly and the labia are slightly fused. Now, please concentrate guys. Let's see some different variants of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Usually congenital adrenal hyperplasia it is going to affect the females and that female will have features of virilization, ambiguous genitalia and hypotension, salt wasting, hypokalemia. But there are certain variants of congenital adrenal hyperplasia where there is hypertension. How this is possible? Please concentrate. If there is a deficiency of this 11 beta hydroxylase, please concentrate. If there is a deficiency of 11 beta hydroxylase, what happens? Again, there is congenital adrenal hyperplasia because there is no cortisol and no aldosterone. But please concentrate here. Whenever there is no 11 beta hydroxylase, the precursor products are going to accumulate. For example, in this condition, the 11 deoxycorticosterone, this one, as there is no 11 beta hydroxylase, this 11 deoxycorticosterone cannot be converted into corticosterone. So, these two products, which are in this red color zone, they are going to be decreased. But what about the 11 deoxycorticosterone guys? This 11 deoxycorticosterone is going to be elevated because it's not getting converted into corticosterone. Important point is that this 11 deoxycorticosterone can also act as a mineralocorticoid. It still have properties to act as just like a weaker version or milder version of the aldosterone. It's just like aldosterone is getting accumulated in the body okay so this 11 deoxycorticosterone is getting elevated due to 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency what happens if 11 deoxycorticosterone is getting building up in the body it just looking like aldosterone is building up in the body if aldosterone is building up in the body there is a salt and water retention okay salt and water are getting reabsorbed back into the body that causes hypertension. Salt in the body, hypertension. So, in this variant of congenital adrenal hyperplasia, there will be hypertension. 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency is going to present with hypertension and ambiguous genitalia. Okay, now let's see one more variant of congenital adrenal hyperplasia where there is a deficiency of 17 alpha hydroxylase. Important point is that 17 alpha hydroxylase, this enzyme is very important for the production of a cortisol pathway and androgen pathway. Okay, it's very clear, right? The cholesterol is getting converted into these pathways, these two pathways with the help of enzyme 17 hydroxylase. Whenever there is no 17 hydroxylase, again there is no cortisol and no androgens. Now, please concentrate. Very interesting. So, this is a condition where there is no cortisol and no androgens. If there is no cortisol, it's very clear that there is no negative feedback on pituitary gland. Again, more ACTH, that more ACTH will cause adrenal hyperplasia. So, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Okay. But here, if you see, not only cortisol is going down, androgens are also going down. The whole pathway is now shunted towards the production of aldosterone. So, in this variant of congenital adrenal hyperplasia where there is deficiency of 17 alpha hydroxylase, 
there are more amount of aldosterone in the body and less amount of cortisol and less amount of deoxy sorry dihydrotestosterone now whenever there are no testosterone what happens now think this is a male chain now imagine that this variant of congenital adrenal hyperplasia is happening in a male fetus for example now in a male fetus there are no androgens whenever there are no androgens in a male developing embryo or male developing fetus what happens the external genitalia will become female like yes for the development of male external genitalia you need to have androgens whenever the androgens are going down in 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency the male will again develop a female external genitalia so what i am trying to put into your mind is that congenital adrenal hyperplasia classically is going to affect female fetuses and female fetuses we have this virilization normal 21 hydroxylase deficiency forms there are certain forms of congenital adrenal hyperplasia like 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency where a male fetus can be affected and this male fetus can develop feminized or complete female external genitalia okay and even in this form because of the increase aldosterone there will be hypertension and hypokalemia aldosterone will kick out the potassium from the body that causes hypokalemia okay so this is all about the congenital adrenal hyperplasia now let's see some images how it look like see here there is clitoromegaly because of the excessive amount of androgens in the classical form 21 hydroxyl deficiency form there is clitoromegaly and this labia are slightly fused okay it just looks like ambiguous whether it's a male or female very much ambiguous and even here there is a clitoromegaly and labial fusion okay now even in this images you can see there is a clitoromegaly here it's very much like a micro small penis okay there is a very much clitoromegaly just looking like this is the glans penis and this is small penis okay so congenital adrenal hyperplasia is a condition which causes ambiguous genitalia a female looks like a male at the time of birth and like the doctors are confused to announce to the parents that whether it is a male child or a female child ambiguous genitalia is seen okay now let's see some cases about congenital adrenal hyperplasia a newborn was born and found to have clitoral enlargement and labia fusion what is the first step in coming to the diagnosis guys what they are saying there is this clitoral enlargement and labial fusion clitoral enlargement and labial fusion means nothing but ambiguous genitalia now this is a newborn see after like you no know, this newborn was born you have to announce to the parents about what kind of baby they had whether it's a male or female now you are in a dilemma that whether this baby is a male or female because this baby is having this ambiguous genitalia so now what we have to do you are supposed to announce to the parents but here there is this ambiguous genitalia to confirm whether this is a male or female the first step remember in ambiguous genitalia the first step to do is karyotyping without any doubt if there are this ambiguous genitalia the first thing to be done is karyotyping okay after this let's see one more case a newborn was born and found to have clitoral enlargement and labial fusion karyotype is done and the karyotypic study is came xx it's a female very much clear the karyotype is xx and the external genitalia is showing ambiguity because of clitoral enlargement and labial fusion okay now you are thinking about see the diagnosis already came into your mind that okay a female with ambiguous genitalia is mostly going to be a case of congenital adrenal hyperplasia but what is the next step to be done based on the options let's derive karyotype no why to do karyotype why because already karyotype is done it came xx 
सीरम पेस्टोस्टिरोन पेल्विक अल्ट्रासाउंड सेवेंटीन हाइड्रोक्सी पोजेस्ट्रॉन लेवल्स नाउ टेल मी सी इन द बैकग्राउंड यू आर हैविंग एन आइडिया दैट दिस इज कंजेनेटल लैटरल हाइपोप्लेशन टू डायग्नोज दैट व्हाट वी डू नाउ फर्स्ट चेक द 17 हाइड्रोक्सी प्रोजेस्ट्रॉन लेवल्स व्हाई बिकॉज़ वी नो इन द कंडीशन ऑफ कंजेनेटल लैटरल हाइपोप्लेशिया द 17 हाइड्रोक्सी प्रोजेस्ट्रॉन्स विल बी डैम एलिवेटेड सो मच एलिवेटेड 800 नैनोग्राम्स पर डेसीलीटर इवन मोर देन दैट so the better option here would be 17 hydroxy progesterone levels okay now let's see one more case a 3 year old child found to have clitoral enlargement and labial fusion karyotype shows xx and serum hydroxy progesterone levels are elevated very clear female karyotype clitoral enlargement and labial fusion which means ambiguous genitalia and even the 17 hydroxy progesterone levels are elevated which is very clear that this is a case of congenital adrenal hypoplasia what is the most appropriate treatment how to treat a child or how to treat this female who is having congenital adrenal hypoplasia what we can do for the replacement of mineralocorticoid you can give fludrocortisone for the replacement of glucocorticoid you can give hydrocortisone okay so salt rich diet not appropriate treatment see salt can be given by because the salt wasting right salt diet can be given but that's not the only thing the main important thing is giving fludrocortisone and hydrocortisone okay so treatment with the glucocorticoids yes treatment with the glucocorticoids give this female okay give this female glucocorticoids and this glucocorticoids especially the cortisol this glucocorticoids will go into her body and this glucocorticoids will give the negative feedback to her pituitary gland so the pituitary gland is not making the acth the glucocorticoid which we are going to give is hydro cortisone okay the mineralocorticoid replacement is fludrocortisone that anyway is not given in the option treatment with the estrogens no we are not going to do that and vaginoplasty see vaginoplasty can be done in even the later half okay even the later life vaginoplasty can be done see you have to remove that like you know phallus or the clitoral megaly you have to remove that and vaginoplasty should be done that is something we are going to do in the later life but now to prevent this child from mortality because there are these electrolyte abnormalities we have to replace the mineralocorticoids and glucocorticoids okay so that thing is very much important after this let's continue with the other question women present to the antenatal clinic she had her last menstrual uh, period 6 weeks ago okay last menstrual period 6 weeks ago urine pregnancy test came positive she had this is important she had a history of a previous child with the congenital adrenal hypoplasia now this mother she is worrying because she is having a baby female baby with the congenital adrenal hypoplasia previously now she is worrying about the current pregnancy that even this baby might have congenital adrenal hypoplasia so how to prevent congenital adrenal hypoplasia in the upcoming child we all know keep this women on dexamethasone this dexamethasone crosses the placental barrier and enters into the fetal circulation and suppresses the acth so the best option is immediate treatment with the dexamethasone okay this is the better option okay after this let's talk about the true versus pseudo hermaphroditism which is a very important now please concentrate what exactly is meant by true hermaphrodite true hermaphrodite means karyotypically both male and female karyotype is present okay both male karyotype that is 46 xy and female karyotype 46 xx both are present gonads show ovo testes which means ovaries on one side testes on other side both ovarian tissue are in a combined both ovarian tissue and testicular tissue is present which is known as ovo testes okay 
सो गोनाइट्स आर बोथ ओवो टेस्टिस एंड व्हाट अबाउट द एक्सटर्नल जेनिटलिया एक्सटर्नल जेनिटलिया विल बी आल्सो अ फ्यूजन ऑफ बोथ द मेल एंड फीमेल डाउन हियर इन दिस इमेज यू कैन क्लियरली सी दैट देयर इज अ फीमेल लाइक जेनिटलिया एंड अ मेल लाइक जेनिटलिया सो बोथ external genitalia is male and female karyotype is also male and female the functional gonads these functional gonads are ovo testes okay so this is what is known as a true hermaphrodite true hermaphrodite is a condition with both male and female internal reproductive functional gonads okay now what about pseudo hermaphrodite we have already discussed what exactly is meant by a pseudo hermaphrodite pseudo hermaphrodite means karyotypically male means the genes are male the chromosomes are male okay karyotypic male but phenotypically looking like a female a male looking like female are you getting can you able to recall something a male looking like a female androgen insensitivity syndrome testicular feminization syndrome okay so that condition is known as a male pseudo hermaphroditism a male looks like a female is known as a male pseudo hermaphroditism and the example is most common example is androgen insensitivity syndrome they can ask you what is the most common cause of male pseudo hermaphroditism it is ais and what does it mean by female pseudo hermaphroditism female pseudo hermaphroditism means a female karyotypic female which means absolutely a female looks like a male are you able to recall that condition which is known as congenital adrenal hyperplasia okay so if a female looks like a male it's not a combination of both male and female the combination of both male and female internal reproductive organs that is the ovo testis he is known as a true hermaphrodite pseudo hermaphrodites are a male looks like a female female looks like a male okay so if a female is looking like a male then it is known as a female pseudo hermaphroditism and the most common cause for female pseudo hermaphroditism is congenital adrenal hyperplasia we have discussed now after this let's see a few important points okay other causes for ambiguous genitalia in a female See what's the most common cause for ambiguous genitalia in a female that's a congenital adrenal hyperplasia where there are too much amount of androgens and those too much amount of adrenal androgens are causing virilization in a female child that we have already discussed but there are certain other conditions like aromatase enzyme deficiency okay imagine that in a female if aromatase is not there what aromatase will do aromatase is the enzyme converting androgens into estrogens okay aromatase aromatase is enzyme converting androgens into estrogens if in a female this aromatase is not there means peripheral aromatization conversion of androgens into estrogens is not happening so there is no estrogens and androgens will accumulate in this female body and these androgens will cause virilization so that the female will develop male looking genitalia ambiguous genitalia so aromatase deficiency will cause that and maternal androgen drug excess see mother is there and now she is a pregnant okay there is a pregnant lady and she is carrying a female fetus now there is this female growing inside her womb now mother is taking excessive androgenic drugs and these drugs are crossing the placenta and entering into this female fetus and in this female fetus they are causing virilization leading to ambiguous genitalia okay that thing and pregnancy luteoma there is this pregnancy luteoma in the mother this pregnancy luteoma is going to produce lots and lots of androgens and these lots of androgens is going to enter into the fetal circulation and in the fetus these androgens maternal androgens are going to cause virilization and ambiguous genitalia so these are certain conditions which are associated with ambiguous genitalia in a female okay so we have discussed the important differences between true hermaphroditism and a pseudo hermaphroditism again i am repeating true hermaphrodite is a condition where there is 
combination or amalgamation of both the sexes ovaries testis ovo testis and both of them are functional and the external genitalia is also a combination of both okay both the male both the male and female looking genitalia okay now after this let's talk about a very small topic which is a mixed gonadal dysgenesis gonadal dysgenesis we have completed gonadal dysgenesis in a male leads to swer syndrome gonadal dysgenesis in a female we have discussed that's a turner syndrome both of them are completed now, mixed gonadal dysgenesis. What does I mean by? See, there is a condition where the person have both the gonads, just like a true hermaphroditism. The person have this both ovo testis, and both of them are non-functional. See, if both the ovo testis, see, if ovo testis are functional, then the person is going to have both the male and female looking genitalia. Now the condition is mixed gonadal dysgenesis. In the condition of a mixed gonadal dysgenesis, the person have both male and female gonads, but both of them are non-functional. If both the male and female gonads are non-functional, means what happens? Just think, ovaries are there, testes are there, both of them are non-functional. So, if both of them are non-functional, there is no estrogen and there is no testosterone. If no estrogen, no testosterone, what will be the external genitalia? There is nothing to do with the estrogens. Estrogens doesn't have any important role in making the external genitalia. It's all about the testosterone and dihydrotestosterone which makes the external genitalia as a male. Now, in this condition, if there is no testosterone, what happens? By default, the external genitalia will become female-like. So, mixed gonadal dysgenesis is a condition where the karyotype is of both the sexes. Both male and female karyotype is there. And gonads, both male and female gonads are there. But they are non-functional, non-functional gonads. So, what happens? The external genitalia will become female-like. Okay? So, important point is that in mixed gonadal dysgenesis, the external genitalia is female. In pure gonadal dysgenesis, for example, Swer syndrome, pure gonadal dysgenesis, there also the external genitalia is female. So, in pure gonadal dysgenesis, the external genitalia is female. Even in Turner, the external genitalia is female. Even in mixed gonadal dysgenesis, the external genitalia is female. Okay, but in true hermaphroditism, the external genitalia is a combination of both the sexes. Okay, now most of the people think the mixed gonadal dysgenesis and true hermaphroditism they are one and the same. No, please concentrate in true hermaphroditism, the external genitalia is a combination of both, but in mixed gonadal dysgenesis, the external genitalia is absolutely female. In true hermaphroditism, the gonads are ovo testis which are functional. In mixed gonadal dysgenesis, both the male and female gonads are non-functional. Okay, so there is a lot of difference between these two conditions. Now, let's talk about Klinefelter syndrome. I don't find any other place to discuss about the Klinefelter syndrome because already we have discussed the Turner syndrome which is the monosomy X. Now, let's discuss about the Klinefelter syndrome. Klinefelter is a condition where there is an extra X. Okay, there is 47 double XY. Instead of 46 chromosomes, there is 47 chromosome. And that extra chromosome is nothing but the X chromosome. Okay, normally male is XY, but there is an extra X. Usually X is something for the female. Y is something for the male. Okay, now having this extra X makes this male a more female-like. Okay, see, because of this presence of extra X, there is this gynecomastia, okay, breast development in the male. Not all the males will have this. Some males with Klinefelter syndrome will present with the gynecomastia, okay. Now, what about the Turner syndrome? Because of the loss of X chromosome, the females are short. Now, in this condition, there is an extra X. So, Klinefelter males are tall, okay. They will have tall stature. Karyotype is 47 XXY. They might have this kind of homastia. 
because of the presence of this extra X chromosome, which is something a more a female thing, the male functions are not going to happen properly. What does I mean by? Because of the presence of this extra X, there will be azoospermia and infertility. Because of this azoospermia, the male can have infertility. The important point is that Turner female is having normal intelligence. She is having a normal IQ. But a person with a Klinefelter syndrome will be present with a mental retardation. Okay, so these are some important points about the clinical syndrome. Again, the same clinical syndrome will be discussed in the topic of male infertility. But for now, this is enough. I have completed all the different types of intersex. Hope the video is helpful. Thank you.